um, advertised, advertised title of the paper. Uh, but as you can see, it's ended up being called Changelings of the Free Market, Neoliberal Gothic and Contemporary Irish Cinema. Um, it was originally given a reversion of it was given um, in Ireland as keynote at a conference um, at St. Patrick's College in Carlo. So I, I've hacked big bits out of it. Um, it may still be a bit long, um, so bear with me. So hello. Um, as Sirik has just said, I am obviously Linny Blake. I'm actually an Americanist by trade and a Gothicist by inclination. And it was this tendency to the dark side that led me, um, as Sirik has said, uh, to set up the Manchester Centre for Gothic Studies in 2013. So while I'm far from being a specialist in Irish Gothic, I've worked for many years on the ways in which horror more broadly, and the Gothic in particular, may interrogate normative conceptions of both selfhood and nationhood in specific historical and cultural contexts. This has led me, just by way of a bit of orientation of this paper, this has led me to a decidedly abject engagement with a range of literary and filmic monsters um, from a range of different times and places. These have included uh, the Onryu of J Horror as articulation of the trauma of enforced Americanization following World War II, the necrophile of the German avant-garde, a figure emerging directly from the repression of the horrors of the Holocaust, the post 9-11 hillbilly reappearing during the early years of the war on terror as interrogation of the nation's contemporary identity as both victim and perpetrator of trauma, the Republican serial killer in the United States as exploration of national identity and harbinger of neoliberal horrors to come, the zombie as, as avatar of pharmacologically interpolated neoliberal subjectivity in the age of austerity following 2008, uh, Trumpian populism and the horrors of postmodern neoliberalism as evidenced in shows like The Handmaid's Tale and movies like The Purge franchise, and most recently, uh, the South Korean serial killer Lee Chun Jai in recent uh, Korean television time slip dramas. So trauma, capitalism, neo-imperialism, that is my shtick. Across this body of work then, I've argued that the explosion in popular interest in the Gothic over the course of the past 40 years has happened for a reason. And that's because the Gothic provides global audiences with a means of challenging free market economics. Neoliberal ideology having made us all mindless zombies, shuffling through the ruins of civil society and howling our despair at the rust belt world the free market has brought into being. So about 10 years ago, I coined the term neoliberal Gothic meaning a form of fantastic cultural product that not only encapsulates the subjectivities and modes of social organization engendered by late capitalism, but also has the potential to challenge them, if only momentarily, before such challenges are inevitably recouped by the very ideologies they expose, because that's what ideology does. Neoliberal Gothic, as I define it then, is therefore a Gothic submode that not only explores the rise of global neoliberalism in the 1980s, but also the global militarization of neoliberal economic models with the war on terror, purportedly in response to the events of 9-11, alongside the increasing control of national politics by the global corporation, even as it charts the traumatizing psychological legacy of escalating inequalities, ongoing colonialist war and an out and out war against the poor within the developed economies of the West and East, global North and South alike. So whilst my work on neoliberal Gothic has focused predominantly on the US and the UK, those colonizing powers that impose by sword and screen, the hard and soft power of the, aggress of the aggressor. I've also had a longstanding interest in nations like Korea that have had their post-colonial Gothic legacy inflected in recent years by the secondary colonization of free market economics. And this brings me at last to Ireland. For Ireland is a prototypically neoliberal Gothic nation, that one that may have resisted British colonialism for centuries, but which entered the EU in 1973, and in so doing embraced a secondary colonization by the imperialism of the so-called free market. From 1973 onwards, in other words, Ireland and indeed the rest of the Eurozone fell in line with economic policies dictated by the United States. These were characterized by fiscal, no, wrong, go back. These were characterized by fiscal conservatism, not spending any money on health, educational benefits, 
economic liberalization, allowing the bankers to do what they damn well pleased, the privatization of state assets, selling off the national silver to the highest bidder, and lower rates of taxation, allowing the rich to get richer and the poor to slide into greater and greater degrees of poverty, with all the implication for physical and mental health, social cohesion, and educational attainment of the masses that that entails. The result was a very different Ireland to that envisaged, say, by the Republic's earliest leaders. Eamon de Valera, for example, fam famously opining in his St. Patrick's Day broadcast of 1943, that the ideal Ireland that we would have, the Ireland that we dreamed of, would be the home of a people who valued material wealth only as a basis for right living, of a people who, satisfied with frugal comfort, devoted their leisure to the things of the spirit, the home, in short, of a people living the life that God desires that men should live. In pursuit of his ideal Ireland, de Valera may have, may have fought British colonial rule, but his party would be the first to abandon the vision of a frugal people living virtual lives of hard work and religious devotion, opting instead to be secondarily colonized um, <clears throat> by an alien economic model that slashed social welfare expenditure, embarked on free-for-all tax cuts and welcomed unfettered foreign investment, even when it gave rise to an out-and-out -out bubble economy of which the inflated housing market was only the most visible symptom. Obviously, and as everyone now knows, it all came crashing down with tarnished Barry, uh, sorry, tarnished Brian Lenahan opting to bail out the banks to the tune of 440 billion euros. That's a massive 36,000 euros per household and borrowing in turn from the Troika of the International Monetary Fund, the European Union and the European Central Bank, bodies that would of course make 100% profit on the 67.5 billion euros they pumped into the Irish economy. Neoliberalism had failed and the cure here is across the world was deemed to be more neoliberalism. Successive austerity budgets insisted on by the EU as part of the bailout package, now shaping not only Irish social policy, but available models of national identity. The religiously inflected nationalist idealism of men like de Valera being replaced by the free market survival of the fittest ethos with its mass unemployment, poverty, mental and physical Ill, Ill health, domestic violence, and that old Irish stalwart mass economically driven migration. It's unsurprising in the light of this, I think, that in recent years, the Gothic has proliferated across Irish popular culture as a means of interrogating both the psychology of the boom times and the traumatic dimensions of contemporary Irish life. For as we all know, the Gothic reaches beneath the rationality of realist fictions to something deeper, darker, and considerably less easy to speak of. It evokes and echoes our fears, and in so doing, it enables us to map the limits of our societies and ourselves. It teaches us not only that things have gone terribly wrong, but that the monsters that haunt the neoliberal hellscape we inhabit may be those we most trusted to keep us safe, may even be ourselves. What follows will argue then that in a range of contemporary Irish films, it's possible to trace the impact of neoliberal economics, both on the social and cultural life of the nation and on the psychology of those who have lived through various stages of the boom and bust cycle, whilst refashioning themselves as neoliberal subjects, not people, but functions of capital, whose success or failure at life is fiscally defined and determined. Some of these films undertake a neoliberal Gothic critique of the economic status quo, and that word critique is essential, whilst others, like the film I'll begin with, merely deploys the world austerity gave us as mise-en-scene, whilst upholding the highly conservative ideology of the dog-eat-dog -dog free market. This film is Kieron Foy's Citadel from 2012, filmed and indeed set in Glasgow, but drawing on Foy's own childhood experience of growing up in Northside Dublin in the 1980s, as neoliberalization transformed the social landscape and entrenched social and economic inequality at the heart of the modern Republic. Unsurprisingly, it's a film profoundly concerned with social collapse. The dilapidated housing estate on which our protagonist Tommy finds himself and in which his pregnant wife is murdered by a group of ravening hooded youths being little short of post-apocalyptic. Attempting to raise his daughter alone while suffering from PTSD-related agoraphobia, Tommy is clearly a mentally ill young man, but his illness is directly attributed to his experience <clears throat> of living in the horrific conditions of the ironically named Edenstown, 
beset by violent youths who have never been socialised into a community. Tommy's world throughout the film is one of utter terror, in fact. He's terrified of leaving his home, but even there knows, him, knows himself to be unsafe. Hooded figures lurk outside his front door and a glimpse through its frosted glass. His flimsy door latch threatens to give in at any moment. The power flickers off and on. Floorboards creak. His baby cries incessantly, all threaten at any moment to drive him over the edge. Only James Cosmo's delightfully sweary priest, in fact, appears willing to do something about the world neoliberalism made. But what he offers is neither economic analysis or a spiritual solution, and you'd kind of expect the latter, if not the former. The tower in which Tommy lives, he says, is inhabited by creatures so degenerate as to have lost their humanity. Utterly feral and indeed blind, they feed on the fear of the community, kidnapping children and turning them into creatures like themselves. It's a nasty piece of victim blaming and entirely in step with the neoliberal ideology that underpins such hoodie horror and recasts victims as villains. So whilst the film's bleak social realist palette, blemmy yellow, snotty green and black, 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 offers an ironic take on the Irish national colours, the film more broadly says some very neoliberal things about those unable or unwilling to buy into the narrative of constant economic growth. Tommy's journey from victim to hero is interesting only insofar as it displays what journalist Richard Seymour has deemed the culture of austerity that values hierarchy, competitiveness and casual sadism towards the weak. Although it's a very gothic depiction of the neoliberal world, the, cit the Citadel isn't actually what I call neoliberal gothic. That's why I open with it. The hoodie horror subgenre being one that invariably depicts working class youth as subhuman monsters who fulfill the same kind of ideological function as the slack jawed denizens of the filmic Appalachians in the United States. They're ideologically conservative stereotypes, and for all they tell us a great deal about the world that put them on screen, they don't offer us any form of critique of that world. And in order to be um, what I term neoliberal Gothic, that critique is absolutely central. Here's a film that does. Look away if you're scared of cows. Lenny, I'm terribly sorry, but there's no sound. Just is that deliberate? Oh no. Okay. There should be sound. I don't know why it's not worked. Um, even so, it gives you a fairly uh, fairly okay. solid. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yeah, that's perfectly. great. I don't know why that didn't work? Um, there's probably some setting we don't know about. It gives you an idea of what the film is about, nonetheless. Um, the year in which 2005's isolation was released saw the population of Ireland reach its highest level since the mid-19th century. I, Irish people returning from abroad to an ostensibly buoyant economy and immigrants from Europe, Africa and Asia arriving in unprecedented numbers. Ireland appeared to have taken its place among the nations of the world, but all was well, um, but all was not well in the small farms of Ireland's traditionally rural economy where competition was the word of the day, both in terms of international markets and within the nations of the European community. 
Oh, sorry. And yes, I actually did research the papers presented at 2005's National Dairy Conference in the writing of this piece. Written and directed by Billy O'Brien and with an impressive cast, including, including the ever lugubrious John Lynch, Essie Davis, Marcel Jures, Sean Harris and Ruth Neger, Isolation won both the Best Director and Best Actress Awards at Hollywood's 20, uh, 2006 Screen Fest. It's an in inventively gothic take on the land and farming in the age of the free market. For in an attempt to save his failing dairy farm, Dan is persuaded by his ex-girlfriend, Orla, a vet, to accept payment from a biogenetics firm to allow his cows to be experimented upon in order to create faster growing and hence more pro profitable cattle. At the hands of the prototypically mad scientist John, however, the offspring turn out to be not quite right. Some have fangs, some have skeletons outside their bodies, and some are actually born pregnant. It's a portentous vision of out of control growth that threatens to change forever, not only the Irish landscape, but that of the world. You see where I'm going with this. All this could descend quite easily into farce, of course, but the success of the film lies in its very seriousness. A desaturated color palette, hyper-realist style, an almost constant rain loans a powerful sense of the quotidian horror of everyday rural life. Orla spends a great deal of time with her hands up a cow, even being bitten by a mutant fetus in the process. And depictions of calves being birthed, one, one with the aid of a winch, adds to the nightmarish intensity, especially, of course, to any of us who have given birth. Orla's attempts to shut it all down fail, of course, as despite euthanizing the mother and one of the calves, another mutant offspring escapes. John quarantines the farm in an attempt to prevent infection of the wider world. But the film ends with Ruth Negger's character, the delightfully named Mary, displaying signs of being pregnant with her own mutant fetus. What strange beast indeed. The motif of science tampering with the natural order of things has of course been a Gothic standby since Frankenstein, but isolation has a pronouncedly neoliberal take on the topic. For John's mission is not only to usurp the place of God, it's to usurp the place of God in the interests of market share. The impression we are left with is that the fiscal imperatives of the town have infected the land as historic site of national identity discourse, and in so doing have made it contagiously monstrous. This is a highly distinctive take on the topic, echoed interestingly, I think, by New Zealand's Black Sheep, released the following year. This being a horror comedy from Ireland's chief competitor in the international milk market, and I now know about these things and beset with its own concerns regarding, of course, the neoliberalization of agriculture. But this is not to argue that the land itself is lacking in its own monstrosity, Ireland's inhabitants having historically coexisted, conceptually at least, and mind you, having been sort of chased down a Kerry mountainside by something very strange, I'm not convinced it's only conceptually, um, lived alongside a range of supernatural entities, that were there before us on the land and erode accordingly a degree of respectful deference. And this of course makes the always already haunted nature of the land an ideal means of exploring both its historic colonization by the English and its recolonization in neoliberal times. It's interesting I think that several of the most accomplished films to, spoke, to focus on spooky landscapes of Ireland have English protagonists, Corin Hardy's The Hallow and Lorcan Finnegan's Without Name, revolving around the terrifying misadventures of Englishmen whose professions take them to ancient Irish forests where they fall foul of entities that may or may not be supernatural. In Without Name, for example, the unhappily married surveyor Eric is sent to a pocket of ancient Irish woodland so liminal that the English translation of its name gives the film its title. Eric's employers are a shadowy corporation that got the land, they say, for a song at the tail end of the boom, capitalizing on a hopeless development that went belly up when the bubble burst. It's an ideal opportunity for Eric as he gets not only to escape his tortuously sullen family life with a wife that clearly hates him and a son looking for any reason to go off the rails, and spend time with his mistress and assistant, Olivia, who is to nobody's surprise, far younger and prettier than he. <clears throat> Unlike the rationalist Eric, 
whom Olivia nicknames Spock, who takes no responsibility for what other people do with the findings of his survey and claims only to trade in distances and angles. Olivia is more, more attuned to the neoliberal context of their shared endeavor. We just cut everything up into saleable little slabs, she says. We don't just measure the land, adding, Jesus, so obnoxious. But Eric is willfully oblivious to whatever the aims of the corporation might be and sets about measuring and quantifying, thinking little of the fact his surveyor's pendulum isn't working properly. And yeah, it's clearly a metaphor and strange figures can be glimpsed in the morning mist. In classic Gothic style, Adam finds a handwritten manuscript entitled Knowledge of Trees in his lodgings. Before long, he's dropping mushrooms with a local hippie, Gus, as you do, remarking that the forest is like a church and believing, as did the author of Knowledge of Trees, that the flora communicates in its own language. For the mushrooms, of course, bring their own magic to the film, which becomes, in the words of the Guardian critic Phil Hode, so trippy it makes Ben Wheatley's A Field in England look like an afternoon in the tax office. Visually, spectacular, full of ultra rapid edits that draw visual linkages between the tangle of branches and the blood vessels and synapses of the human brain. The film takes us deep within the forest and ourselves, where we, like Eric, become first disoriented and then lost, multi-tracked sound that shifts from speaker to speaker, adding significantly to the disorientation. Before long, Eric's talking to the trees and we're not that far behind him. This is Eden, the author of The Language of Trees, claims Eden again. We've already had um, the Citadel's dystopian Edenville. Um, and the forest that was robbed from us is a liminal space where nature and humanity were once at one. But Eric's connection to the natural world has been broken by it, his complicity with its commodification, as evidenced by his indifference to his wife and son, his inability to communicate with his mistress, and yes, his broken pendulum. Here is a man who sets out to facilitate the destruction of one of the last vestiges of the ancient past and in so doing destroys himself. This is powerfully reminiscent of The Hallow, a film released the previous year, which is even prefaced by a title card purporting to quote in translation from the 12th century Book of Invasions, a collection of poems and prose narratives in the Irish language intended to be a history of the land and its people from the creation of the world to the Middle Ages. It says, hallow be thy name and blessed be their claim. If you who trespass put down roots, then hallow be your name. The hallow we later learn is a collective noun for Ireland's original supernatural inhabitants, or as the film calls them, the fairies, the little people, baby stealers, who have been driven from their sacred lands by man with iron and fire. As our conservationist protagonist Adam appears to discover when he comes to map an ancient forest on a remote Irish island, the island though, they've only been driven to the margins, that place where of course the Gothic lives. There's something nasty waiting for the Englishman in the woods, in other words, a paradigm that's, that's a delightful melange of post-colonial, ecological and neoliberal Gothic. For as Adam and his family arrive on the island, a radio programme playing on the car radio explains, Greece is not the only member of the poor Eurozone club to consider selling off bits of its environment in order to meet the bailout repayments demanded by the EC. What's more, the selling of such environment would leave Ireland, the radio programme says quite factually, um, as the only country in the developed world without a publicly owned forest. This deforestation of Ireland has a pronouncedly colonialist history, of course, Ireland becoming a source of timber for England as early as the 12th century, meaning by 1656, only 2% of Ireland was wooded, a level it's failed to improve on to the present day. It's significant, in other words, that the forest should be so prevalent in post-crash Irish horror cinema, given that the nation has been stripped of its, horrors, it, of its forests historically. It also goes some way to explaining the rather odd name of the organization that in this film springs up to challenge the EU driven sell off. It's not called Save Our Trees, as you might imagine, but Free Our Trees. It's an anti colonialist slogan, far more than an ecological one, I think. And the new colonizers are the free marketeers of the EU. The battle lines are drawn from the outset then between the protagonist's English scientificism 
he discovers a colonizing fungus early in the film and makes uh, clear that it has the capacity to invade the brain and bend the host to its will. And the ostensibly superstitious primitivism of the quasi-nationalist eco-sensitive locals. The latter is typified by his neighbor, Colin Donnelly, who's unhappy at the family's presence and afraid that in removing the iron bars from their dilapidated Georgian house's windows, they have left themselves open to supernatural attack. For Donnelly too has been subject to personal loss. His daughter Cora, bottom left in the slide, having disappeared into the forest in childhood. Things of course go from bad to worse. The fungus penetrates the house, the car and Adam himself. And in their attempt to flee, the family are attacked by the very creatures Donnelly has been trying to warn them about, creatures that have themselves been radically changed. Thus the fungal infection of the landscape echoes the first British, first British colonialism's transmutation of Ireland into an ecologically denuded English-speaking colony, the natural assets of which were expropriated regardless of the needs of the indigenous population, even in times of genocidal starvation. And secondarily, it echoes the contagious impact of neoliberalism upon the national psyche. For as some of the most vaunted excesses of the Celtic tiger years would seem to indicate, Neoliberalism too infects and transmutes both individuals and societies, refashioning them in its own image as conspicuous consumers, enthusiastic investors and credulous dupes of the bankers. Although it's clearly eco-Gothic in orientation, the idea of the land being first commodified and then despoiled in isolation, the hallow and no name. And the impulse to do this being intrinsically linked the to the transformative energies of late capitalism that turn us all into agents of the free market. This is a profoundly Gothic paradigm. Frequently, such depictions focus on the family and specifically, as we've seen already, in the shape of Adam's son, Finn, and Donnelly's daughter, Cora, on the ways in which children themselves may be transformed or indeed replaced by forces beyond parental control. This plays, of course, on the Irish mythos of the changeling, but it also indicts the ideological interpolation of the generation that grew to adulthood during the so-called Celtic Tiger, the generation that believed the injunctions of men like Bertie Ahern, Brian Lenahan and Sean Fitzpatrick, and in so doing became a new kind of Irish citizen. Wakewood from 2009, um, for example, is one such film. Focusing on the middle-class daily family, Father Patrick, a vet, Mother Louise, a pharmacist, and little Alice, who celebrates her ninth birthday at the start of the film in the family's swanky Georgian townhouse, but is mauled to death by a dangerous dog on her way home from school, leaving her distraught parents to relocate their fractured marriage to the depths of the countryside and a village called Wakewood. And the name, of course, is no coincidence, as the inhabitants possess all the dark magics to bring back the dead, if only for three days, only within the borders of the town, and only if the deceased has been dead for less than a year. Again, the contrast between modern scientificism, the wind turbines that mark the border of the village, and the ritualistic primitivism of the villagers is pronounced. The everyday texture of farming life, all rain, shit, shoving your arms into cows and occasionally being crushed to death by mad livestock is thus contrasted not only to the medical knowledge of Patrick, but to the ancient knowledge possessed by the locals. Resembling nothing as, as much as a John Millington Sing ensemble cast, the villagers are thus at home in what is pretty much an Irish updating of the W.W. Jacobs, Jacobs story, The Monkey's Paw whilst the film itself echoes both Stephen King's Pet Cemetery and Nicholas Rogue's 1973 Don't Look Now, itself, of course, based on a short story by Daphne du Maurier. And as is the case in all these texts, the grieving parents here will do literally anything to bring back their child, if only to have time to say goodbye to her properly. And it is this that leads them to neglect to mention that Alice has been dead for more than a year. Obviously, Alice, like poor Dan's cows, Donnelly's daughter and, and possibly Adam's son, comes back wrong, prone first to cattle mutilation and, and later on out and out murder. When she finally is returned to the earth, she drags her mother down with her 
leaving Patrick with the only option of resurrecting his wife and it's implied, but thankfully not shown, cutting the fetus out of her. What kind of child, what kind of future that could be delivered um, from this monstrous pregnancy is difficult to imagine. But Lee Cronin's The Hole in the Ground of 2019 goes some way to depicting both, um, as indeed does um, Brendan Muldowney's The Cellar from 2022, um, both of which you know, I originally wrote about, but I've excised uh, for the sake of con concision. Finally, though, I, I will talk for a minute about Kate Dolan's superlative, You Are Not My Mother from 2021. Um, because here it's the mother who appears to be changed and not the daughter, Shah, who must establish what has happened and attempt to set things right. The film opens with a flashback, a baby dumped in a buggy in the middle of the road in a suburban cul-de-sac at night. On the periphery of the screen, two women appear to be arguing. One takes the buggy and limps off into the woods. Here, taking direction from a handwritten notebook, she kindles a fire around the baby who screams as the flames grow and the camera tilts upwards to the film's title. Moving to the present day, we learn that the limping woman was the baby's grandmother attempting to save her as she did her own daughter before her from the changeling's fate. Shah's mother um, remains though in a depressive state. She spends most of her time in bed, unable to shop for food or drive safely. So having nearly hit a horse standing unattended in the street, she disappears, leaving her car unattended in the middle of the field. When she reappears, she's a different woman. She cooks, she dresses in colorful clothing and even dances. But as Halloween approaches, a time as the guide on a school trip puts it, when the veil between our world and the other world is at its thinnest, allowing spirits to pass through, Shah begins to wonder whether Angela is her mother at all. Granny Rita, um, the, the lady at the start with the baby, um, something of a crone, prone to making creepy charms from things she finds on the, on the floor, from the forest floor, acknowledges something is wrong, and her school friend Suzanne also shares some of her anxieties, um, living herself with a mentally ill parent. Thus, the film walks the line between domestic realism of the Lochian variety, a working class suburb with little cash to spare, mental and physical illness, the prospect of a bright child being held back by her environment, and something rather older, more folkloric, that is still making its present fe presence felt in suburban Dublin. This is echoed in the film's mise-en-scene, production designer Lauren Kelly's beige and brown interiors being contrasted with the green of its more open spaces and the multicolored tones of its skies, even as the bizarre and otherworldly score by the avant-garde, by the avant-garde sound artist De Hexen ups the alterity at every turn, particularly in Shah's increasingly disturbing nightmares and her mother's increasingly bizarre behavior. What's profoundly distinctive about You Are Not My Mother, and I, I think it's a really, really worth a watch. What's profoundly distinctive about it for me though, is its encapsulation of the impact of 14 years of neoliberal economics on both the social and psychological life of the nation, and which had you know, um, an impact that, that disproportionately fell on women. Intergenerational mental illness is foregrounded as a realist explanation for Shah's family's ills. And although there's nothing in the way of hoodie horror underclassery here, there's clear evidence of economic scarcity, of unemployment and underemployment, um, and uh, families whose lives are constrained by a lack of opportunities. It's a dispiriting picture and a really superlative piece of neoliberal Gothic to boot. So I'm coming to the end now, you'll be glad to hear. Having journeyed together across the recent economic history of the nation, Having looked at a range of films and made a number of statements regarding the cultural work undertaken by Gothic texts in late capitalism, what, it's fair to ask, am I actually arguing here? What has it all been about? When I first set out to write this paper, I conceptually clustered my films into two distinct categories. The first I called The Haunted Land, and it contained um, many of the films that I've actually talked about today. My second group I called Haunted Houses, Haunted Towns. And as you can see, I've only had the chance to talk about a couple of them and then only briefly. 
uh, writing this has been tricky, continues to be tricky. In other words, it started off at about 15,000 words and I've had to chainsaw it down and then chainsaw it again. So obviously quite a lot's been lost. I'd have liked to have had, ha, I'd have liked time to talk about houses, of course, in the way that Tracy Fahey did so brilliantly in my own neoliberal Gothic collection. The phenomenon of the ghost estate as brilliantly captured by Conor O'Callaghan's novel, Nothing on Earth, for example, being a distinctively Irish example of neoliberal Gothic. And this would have led me to talk more about Vivarium, Lorcan Finnegan's 2020 follow-up to No Name, which offers the bleakest of allegories for heteronormative domesticity of the neoliberal age. This being set in another form of ghost estate, haunted, to borrow Tracy's words, by the forlorn ghosts of a future that will never take place. And at this point, I'd have gone all post-apocalyptic and talked about Orpen, heroine of Sarah Davis Goff's rather splendid novel, Last Ones Left Alive, traversing a long dead nation inhabited only by scrake, zombies whose ravening appetites offer us an appropriate vision of late capitalism's hunger to consume everything before it, including the planet itself. But I didn't have time and you've heard what I ended up with. So what can I conclude? Essentially, it seems to me all the texts I focused on have been predicated on a very old Gothic device, that of doubling. The pairing of protagonists and paradigms in a manner that illuminates differential aspects of the human psyche, the social world, the national culture, and so on. Such doubling both affirms and resists the binary logic upon which post-enlightenment rationality rests. The better first to delineate and then challenge dominant belief systems. And all of this is linked, I think, to the Gothic's own ability to attract and repulse, to engender transgressive desire and identification with otherwise forbidden needs, drives and acts. To get us to ask, of course, what is, monstrous, what is monstrosity? Um, who decides and why? Thus, the animal world of Dan's dairy herd is doubled with the human world of genomic interference for profit. The ancient forest's very being is doubled with the rationalist will to anatomize its microbiology for profit and quantify its sellable acreage. The natural cycle of life and death is doubled with humanity's will to transcend mortality. And throughout these texts, children and adults are themselves doubled, being infected with fungus or exchanged for fairy children or that of strange shape-shifting fetches. And time and time again, everything comes back wrong. And this, of course, is the essence of what I've been trying to argue. The neoliberal world promised us endless growth and trickle down wealth, all guided by the invisible hand of the market. It mutated our homes and families. It poisoned our land and reached into our very selves with its sadistic cupidity. What came back to haunt us wasn't only the future that didn't happen, but the future that came back wrong when Ireland went off to take its place at the heart of the global free market. It became, in turn, a nation of mass unemployment, poverty, mental and physical ill health, domestic violence, and again, economically driven migration. As is the case in many post-colonial nations, I've argued, it's an ancient figure drawn from the indigenous consciousness that in recent horror cinema encapsulates the sense of damage, loss and corruption engendered by neoliberalism's secondary colonization of the nation. Ireland has, emerged in, uh, Ireland has emerged in these films, I've argued, as a changeling nation, locked in an ongoing struggle for selfhood in a world that subsumes national difference to global markets and consumes human beings in the interests of ongoing fiscal liquidity. It's a chilling picture. But hey, that's neoliberalism and the neoliberal Gothic for you. Thank you. Thank you, Linny. That was absolutely blistering. Fantastic. Uh, I've, I've asked people to post questions and I think we're going to stop the recording now as well. Shall I stop sharing that screen as well? I don't know how to do it.